Welcome to Python tutorial 4 about loops. The only prerequisite for this tutorial is Python tutorial 1. So if you're still learning about arrays or if you haven't done tutorial 2 and tutorial 3 yet, that's fine. You only need to know how to write basic Python code using variables and you're ready to talk about loops. The idea of a loop is that it's a set of instructions that you want the code to repeat over and over again. Let's suppose you're adding up, you know, a sequence of numbers. You don't want to have to tell the code add up every single one. You want to be able to give the sequence and then say loop down this sequence and add all these numbers together. It's a more efficient way of writing the code and it makes more sense to us, right? When you and I think about instructions, we think about I need to do this thing and then I need to do it three more times and then I can move on to the next step. So one of the ways you can write a loop in Python is with the for loop structure. The idea of a for loop is that you're giving some sort of range of values. The range function is really useful in Python. It creates a list of values. In this case, it would start at zero and go up to, but not including 10, uh, going up in steps of one. Uh, there's other options you can throw in here. You don't have to start at zero. You don't have to go in steps of one, but this is kind of the basic way of setting it up. And so what will happen with this for loop is it's going to repeat the next set of instructions over and over again for each new value of i. So in other words, it's going to go around the loop once with i equals zero, then around the loop again with i equals one, then around the loop again with i equals two, et cetera, et cetera, until we reach the last value. Then it goes down that one more time and then it leaves the loop. You can also think of it grammatically as saying for each value of i in this range, do the following. The colon here is uh, to signal to Python that the loop is going to begin on the next line. It's your way of grabbing Python's attention and saying that the next segment is going to be different. The way you tell Python what's included in the loop is with an indentation. You literally just press tab or spacebar a couple times. You make all those repeated instructions line up with each other in the code and Python knows that those are going to be the things that are repeated. Think of it almost like making an outline in your composition writing class where you have the main point and then you have sub bullets underneath that. That's exactly what's going on here. We're declaring that there is a loop here and then everything that's tabbed underneath that is included in the loop. So this is part of the loop. This is part of the loop. This line is not part of the loop. You notice it's unindented. And so we're back to that sort of main level now. And so by the time we get to line five, we are outside of the loop. So there's no formal declaration of when the end of the loop is. You just get to a line that's not in the loop and that must be where the loop ends. Uh, and so I asked you a couple of questions here about what's going on in this code. Why are all these I values different? Why is finished only printed once? And then there's a checkpoint here where I'm asking you to start with that same code. So start with this code that we have up here and modify it to produce this output. You might notice there are some things that are similar, but there are some things that are different. And so you just need to look up at the code here and identify what do I need to change in this loop to produce this section here. And then there's something different down here, right? You will have to add a second loop. So you'll have your first loop and then you'll start a new loop after that first loop finishes so that you get a, a second loop down there. Uh, you also might like to Google search uh, Python's range function to find out uh, about how it works. How do you get these things to count downward instead of counting upward, right? Because this is starting at 10 and going down to one. How do we get it to do that? So now that you have some idea of how to set up a loop, let's take a look at what makes loops very powerful, is this idea that I can run the same computation over and over again, but change it slightly. Let's go back to our example of calculating square root of two using this Taylor series, right? This thing gets to be a pain to write out by hand. It even gets to be a pain to type up because we're having to copy and paste and modify. Well, that's exactly what a loop is for. In order to set this thing up in a loop, I have to do a little bit of mathematical manipulation in order to get it into a form that Python can repeat in each go round of the loop. For example, I need to be able to tell Python to alternate positive sign and negative sign, right? Plus, minus, plus, minus. 
In order to do that, we're using this negative one to the n plus one because the first term has a positive one, second term has a negative one, third term has a positive one. And so negative one to an integer will alternate between plus one and negative one. And that's what we want to happen here. The next thing we want to have is one over n factorial. So I've got a one factorial here, two factorial, three factorial, etc. Factorials are really easy to keep track of in the loop because I just have to multiply by the next value. And so that's exactly what we're doing down here. We're starting out with a factorial value of one and then we just multiply by the next one. And so that value there, that variable is gonna build out the factorial value that we need. Uh, similarly, we've got a one over two to the n here, right? So I've got a one half here, two factors of two, three factors of two, four factors of two, etc. That's what I'm doing down here. We're taking one over two to the nth power. Uh, next comes the square root of c. We have so many factors of it in the denominator. This is just a little way of encoding how many factors of root c do we have. Uh, there's other ways to do that, right? I could just multiply it by one over c each time because I'm picking up another factor of one over c. It all depends on how you want to set it up. Uh, there's always an extra factor of x minus c. So we're gonna raise x minus c to the n power with each term, right? First power has one power, second term has the second power, third term has the third power, etc. The last piece we have to keep track of are these odd integers up at the top, right? This is coming from the derivatives that we're taking of the square root function. So first I have just a one up top, then a one times three, then one times three times five, one times three times five times seven. It's a lot like the factorial, but it's only odd numbers. Uh, and so we're setting that up here where we start out with one and then we multiply by the next odd number. 2 times n minus 1 is a clever way of getting the next odd number. It's always going to be odd, and it's always going to go up by 2 because n's going up by 1 each time we go around the loop. And so what we're able to do there is build out this loop that adds to the square root of x the next term each time, right? This is exactly the equation that we have up here. We're updating all of the factors that we need, and then we're printing out our next successive approximation for the square root of 2. And so there's a checkpoint down here that uh, asks you to uh, talk through uh, why, where does a sub n occur, where are we encoding each of these pieces, how are we updating them, and uh, how close can you get to square root of 2 by increasing the number of terms uh, in the summation, meaning the number of times that the loop repeats itself. So that's an introduction to for loops. Uh, there's another type of loop that Python offers you, which is called the while loop. The main difference is whether you know ahead of time how many times your loop is going to repeat. If you know ahead of time that your loop needs to repeat 20 times, then you can just say for i in range 0 to 20, go. And it will repeat 20 times. You don't really need to set up anything fancy for it. But sometimes you don't know how many times the loop is going to repeat. Let's suppose you're doing a projectile motion problem, right? You're trying to launch something from one point of the field to another. You want the code to stop when the projectile reaches ground level, but you don't know ahead of time how many loops that's going to take. If you already knew that, you would have solved the problem already, right? So the idea of a while loop is that it can repeat an arbitrary number of times until some condition is met. So the way you set it up, is you say while condition and another colon, right? The colon's just there to signal the beginning of the loop. Condition here is some sort of logical statement. It's something that Python can evaluate as true or false. Uh, it usually involves comparison operators like equals. So when you have equals equals, you're asking, is this thing on the left equal to this thing on the right? No or yes. Uh, then there's less than or equal to. It does exactly what you would think. It's a thing on the left E less than or equal to the thing on the right. Or greater than is the thing on the left less than or greater than the <clears throat> is the thing on the left greater than the thing on the right. Uh, so the condition tells Python when to continue the loop. I think this is a confusion some students run into is that they think that they have to put the stopping condition in here. What you're actually doing is putting in the continuation condition. Because what it's literally saying, if you put this as a sentence, is while condition is true, do the following. So for example, let's suppose you had some variable x that you were updating. And uh, you wanted to continue the loop until x 
exceeded three. So as soon as it hits 3.00001, you want the loop to stop. You would write that as while X is less than or equal to three because you want it to run while X is less than or equal to three. You want it to stop if X becomes greater than three. Uh, you could also write this as X less than three. In that case, it's going to run almost the same. It's just going to stop if X also equals three, right? So you have to think about which case do you want. So as an example, let's suppose you wanted to print the Fibonacci sequence. And let's suppose you wanted to print them until the value in the sequence got above 100. You could write that like this, right? For the Fibonacci sequence, you need to keep track of two numbers. You have to keep track of your previous number in the sequence and your current value in the sequence. So we're going to call those two values previous and current. Fibonacci sequence, you can start with 0 and 1. And then you just calculate the next value as the previous value plus the current value. So this is the main calculation, right? This is the thing that gives you Fibonacci is that you add the two previous numbers to get the next number. And then we just rename previous and current, right? Or we, we reassign those values here so that we're always looking at the last two values in the series. Well, I can do that with a while loop, right? This is a set of instructions that's going to be repeated. So this is a great candidate for a loop. Now, I don't know how many times this loop needs to repeat. I don't know where we start to exceed 100 in the Fibonacci sequence. I don't have that many of them memorized. So I'm just going to tell Python, keep running this loop while the current value is less than or equal to 100. In other words, as soon as current gets above 100, then you need to stop. And that's what we get here, right? We print each of these values. So we've got the good old 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89. And then we stop, right? Because that next value must be bigger than 100. And you could play around with this, right? You could change this maximum, for example, to 200. And there I get all the way up to 144. Oh, I only get one more. So there's only one value in the Fibonacci sequence between 100 and 200. Uh, you can make this thing 2,000 if you wanted to. Get out a much longer uh, set of the Fibonacci sequence. But it's always going to stop because you're eventually going to reach this value, right? The Fibonacci sequence is only going to grow. So uh, you can make this as high as you want. It will eventually cut off there. And then there's another checkpoint down here uh, that just asks you, um, <clears throat> how does the output change if you if you change the while condition? So for example, suppose you make this current into previous or next. How is the behavior going to change? What makes the behavior difficult? And then there's another question for you here where I've pasted in our computation of square root of 2. I want you to take this for loop, right? It's originally for loop. I want you to replace that with a while loop. So you're going to delete that part, replace it with a while loop that checks for whether uh, the difference between our computed square root of x and the actual value is greater than some value. This is a great way to do an, uh, an approximation scheme as you keep repeating the calculation until your difference, until your error gets acceptably small. Uh, just a hint, you'll probably want to make this absolute value of the actual value minus uh, your calculated square root of x. Because if you, if you say, you know, run this while the difference is less than 0. 0.0001, remember that difference is going to be positive, negative, positive, negative. As soon as it's negative, it's going to trigger the loop to stop. So you really want it to be while the absolute value of the difference between these two is less than 0. 0.0001. So as always, I want to give you a heads up on some common errors that occur when working with Python. Uh, the error I always make, and I mean always, is I start to use a variable in a loop before I have declared it, right? Because there's this whole preamble that leads up to your loop. And sometimes you define, sometimes you start using a variable in a loop, and in your head you say, oh yeah, I need to define that. I need to set up its initial value. And then you just, you forget to because you're so excited to run your nice fancy loop. So that's what this little uh, question asks you to look for is what is this code trying to accomplish and where is the error and what can you do to fix the error? So that's the basics of what you need to know about loops in Python. Uh, there is an advanced topic on here I'd like to talk about uh, that if you are feeling comfortable with loops, uh, this is a great next thing to try. If you're not feeling comfortable with loops, go get some more practice, pause the video, come back to, to this timestamp. Um, but one of the most powerful things we can do with loops is we can nest them, meaning I can place one loop 
inside another loop, right? I can have two loops going on at once. Um, the loops don't run simultaneously. What will happen is you'll have an outer loop that is running more slowly and an inner loop that is running more quickly. Think of it almost like uh, a minute hand and an hour hand on an analog clock, right? The, the, the minute hand zips around, right, once per hour, and once the minute hand goes all the way around, the hour hand is allowed to go forward one. Right, and then the minute hand has to go all the way around again, and then the hour hand can go forward. Right, and so while the minute hand is going around multiple times per day, the hour hand is only going to go around the one time in a 12 hour period. Well, that's exactly what we have here. We have an outer loop that's going to go around more slowly in the code, and an inner loop that's going to go around more quickly. So you almost have to read these things from the inside out, so, because what will happen is, in this loop, for example, we're going to start looping over n, and Python is going to say, okay, m starts out at 0, and when I get back around here, I'm going to increase m to 1. And then this loop says, okay, great, there's another variable called n, we're going to start it at 0, and then loop 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. So while m is equal to 0, n is going to increment. It's going to go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, reset, and then this one's going to increment 1. So we, again, we go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, reset, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc., etc., right? So think of think of this N as going around really fast, kind of lapping the, the M, and the M is going around more slowly, so it only increments as soon as N is done. It's also important to note that the N loop will reset, right? So it's going to go 0 through 10, or 0 through 9, excuse me, 0 through 9, 0 through 9, 0 through 9, every time the M resets. In other words, this particular loop is going to run 100 times, because N is going to go around to 10 values, M is going to go around to 10 values, and you're going to get every possible combination, so you have 10 times 10 gives you 100. Uh, down here I give you an example of that, and there are some questions for you to answer about what does X change, what does when does Y change, how many times does X change, how many times does Y change, trying to understand this output here based on these two loops. Finally, here's one more advanced topic. If you have completed Python Tutorial 2, please continue on because this is going to be very useful. If you have not completed Python Tutorial 2, just pause the video, come back when you've completed that one. Um, arrays and loops work hand in hand very nicely. Because remember, an array is a whole string of, I shouldn't say string, because an array is a whole sequence of numbers. And a loop is all about visiting successive things to do the same operation over and over again. So a loop is a really great way to work with an array. Let's suppose, for example, you had an array that had 20 numbers in it. You're going from 1 to 20. And you wanted to take that array and reverse it. You want to go from 20 down to 1. Or, or, or maybe it's not quite so, so neat and tidy. Maybe you've done some math on those 20 values and you just need to reverse them without having to do the math all over again. You can do that really easily with a for loop because you can loop over the index of the array. So i here is going to be the array index, and so it's going to be the ith element of first array. So we're going to go first array of 0, the first array of 1, first array of 2, first array of 3, etc, etc. I can then flip that around for the second array by doing 19 minus i. So that one's going to go 19, 18, 17, 16, etc, etc. And so the 19th element of this one is going to be the 0th element of this one and on and on. And that's what you get here, right? You're going 1 through 20, then 20 through 1. And the loop has facilitated that process because the loop enables us to easily visit each element of the array. You can even do that directly. Um, this is kind of the clunky way to do it. It's the way I usually do it because it's my brain thinks in this way more often. But there's actually a more elegant way to do this, which is to just loop over the elements themselves. So for example here, we have the structure for element in y. So let's suppose you have this, this y array here. You can just say for element in y. Element here is, um, it's kind of a placeholder name. So element is going to eventually be every single element in y. It's going to start with element 0, element 1, element 2, etc. And I don't actually have to provide the index because it is the element itself in the array. And then I can do math on that, uh, print it, do, do some operations on it, etc. And I don't have to worry about all those indices flying around.